today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, but today also is the feast of the exaltation of the cross. So September the 14th, I'm going to be back here in Danbury after a long trip across the globe. I'm just back in business the second week here, so I'll be back two weeks before preaching retreats in Coles Falls, Idaho. And so it's so good to be back here in Danbury. As we say, we'll take you to the cross. Your only record as a king is weakness. 
The only kingdom you have handed to you by your father is a disaster. What should you do? Raise an army. And so he was inspired by God to raise an army. And he was also inspired to attack. He was not going to defend Jerusalem, which he had failed in defending. He was not going to defend his kingdom, which he had failed in defending. He raised an army, and he attacked. And Khosrow had sent his three greatest generals against him, who were defeated and killed in battle. And they were so slaughtered by the small army. And remember, these are soldiers who had been gathered together, who had been defeated and massacred in battle. They were put back together, but this time Heraclius, instead of trying to defend his kingdom, decided to attack. Instead of trying to defend his kingdom, he decided to attack the enemy and to go after the Holy Cross. And he would get back the Holy Cross. And the generals were defeated and slaughtered. The army of, of the Persians, the greatest army in the world at the time by far, was destroyed. And so much so that Khosrowes was afraid. And he made his second son, because his eldest son was not there, he was back in Persia, he made his second son the king. And then he fled across the river into Persia. And when the eldest son had heard that the second son was made king, he was very angry. And so he plotted a murder. And he went and killed his own father, who was trying to escape. And then he killed his brother, who had become the king in his stead. And there arose a great dissension and a great loss of, of what they were already in a bad state, but now they were completely defeated, and they didn't know what to do. And Arapio said, there strong terms of peace, and said, you will return the Holy Cross. So they returned the Holy Cross. And Arapio carried that Holy Cross back to Jerusalem. When he arrived at the city of Jerusalem, on this 14th of September, he carried the cross. And the king carried the cross, he put on his gold investments and his crown, and he carried the cross through the streets of Jerusalem up to the rock of Galgotha. And when he reached the walk of Galgotha, he couldn't climb the rock. He couldn't move a step further. And finally, Zacharias, the bishop of Jerusalem, said, You are not dressed as the king of kings was dressed. You are not dressed as he was dressed when he climbed the rock of Calvary, and therefore he took off his kingly robes, and he put on the robes of a beggar. And then he carried the cross. And it was so easy to carry up Calvary. When he had carried it up to that point, it was heavy. When he was carrying his gold investments. But when he put on the bags of a beggar, he carried the cross to the top of Calvary. And it was so light and so easy to carry. And very easily he carried it up to the top of Calvary and placed it in its place. And so we have the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross established on this day. And it teaches us a few things. What are we to do when we are attacked? What are we to do in battle when we are fighting for Christ? What are we to do? General George Patton said to his soldiers, Don't hold on to anything. We are not interested in holding positions. We're not interested in holding battle lines. Hold on to nothing except for the neck of the enemy. That's what you hold on to until he's dead. And in war, we don't hold on to positions. We don't hold on to our battle lines. We don't try to defend what we have conquered. We go on to the enemy and we hold on to his neck until he is defeated. When we read the Gospel of today, our Lord Jesus Christ, is speaking to the crowds of the Jews. He's speaking to his enemies. And it is only a few days before his crucifixion. He is about to be crucified in only a few days. And you know that the Pharisees know that though this man is popular, they're about to get him. The Sadducees know that he's popular now, but he is about to be conquered. And that is what they think. And so this is one of the days in which our Lord Jesus Christ stands as a soldier. And he stands as a warrior. And he is speaking to his enemies, but not to his friends. And our Lord Jesus Christ stands up and it says, And Jesus said to the multitudes of the Jews, 
These are the ones who a few days later will say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And what does he tell them? Now is the judgment come upon the world. Now is the judgment come on the world. Doesn't say it's come in the future, but now. Now is the judgment come upon the world. Now is the prince of this world, Lucifer, Satan, he shall be each year for us. He shall be thrown outside. He shall be cast out. Now the world is judged. And now he shall be cast out. And what are we thinking of? Remember that Noah stood before the people of the world. Noah told them, the world is judged. And the sins of this world shall be wiped out. And God shall send down his judgment upon this world. And he shall wipe it out by the great waters of a flood that will cover the entire world. And you will see, of all the boats in the world, they shall not survive this flood. But this boat, which is a very strange boat, which does not have an, a, 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 a keel, doesn't have a, a rudder. And this boat, which is built far away from the sea, this boat shall survive. But no other boat shall survive. And he went inside of the ark. And he brought in all of the animals, two of each kind. And he closed the door. When the door was closed, the battle was over. And the enemy was defeated. And all those who were outside were condemned. But when was the flood? There was no rain. For eight days, it was no rain. For eight days, it was a normal thing. And the people gathered around the ark. Behold Noah. He talked about victory. Behold Noah. He talked about judgment. Behold Noah. He said that all shall die. He brought all the animals inside the ark. How long can he stay locked up inside of that ark? And then the rains came. And the water killed all those outside the ark. And they begged for forgiveness. And darkness overshadowed the earth from this great rain of 40 days and 40 nights. And they were in the darkness and they begged forgiveness. And they begged to be saved. And they were all drowned. And that is why our Lord Jesus Christ, the warrior, says, Now is judgment come upon the world. The judgment comes before the battle. The judgment comes before the blood. The judgment comes before the sword. And one day after you've been waiting, you heard, I heard about the judgment, where's the judgment? I heard about the flood, where's the flood? I heard about the victory of Christ, where's the victory? And imagine the anger of Satan when he heard Jesus Christ say these words. The prince of this world, Satan, he shall be cast out and Satan was angry. I will cast you out, said Satan. I will destroy you, said Satan. I have prepared all these people who now say that you are the king of kings. I have prepared them to say their blood shall be upon themselves and their children. I have prepared their hearts. I have prepared the king. I have prepared Judas. I have prepared your other apostles who are all wimps. I know that when the fight comes, they will flee. I know that when the fight comes, Judas will turn you in for a small bit of money. I know that when the fight comes, these Jews that say you are the son of David, they will say, let your blood be upon us and upon our children. I know when the fight comes, you will be abandoned. I have prepared them all. I've done my best preparation of the last 4,000 years. They are all prepared to defeat you. And this is what Satan thought. And he was very angry. But what did Jesus Christ say? Now has judgment come upon the world. And these words are being repeated now. Judgment has come upon the world. The prince of this world shall be cast out. Satan is prepared for the destruction of the church. He has prepared for the death of all Catholics. He has looked upon the priests and the bishops of the church. And he has seen that those that are even the friends of God are wimps. 
Those that are the followers of Christ, they have no strength, and they will flee with the smallest sign of battle. And he knows that those who call themselves the friends of God will be the same ones that will say, there's the priest, this is the priest who used to say mass for me. I know where he hides out. I'll take you to him. When the time comes that they arrest the priests, when the time comes that they go after us, it shall be our faithful that turn us in. It shall be our fellow priests that turn us in and betray us. That's the way it shall be. It's the way it has always been. It's the way it will always be. The servant is not greater than his master. He was betrayed and put to death by his own people, not by the Romans. He was betrayed by his own disciples, not by those that were on the outside. And so it shall always be until the ending of time. And therefore it seems as though the devil is on the close victory. But these very apostles that would be cowards, they shall be transformed into the enemies of the Satan. And they shall be transformed into unconquerable apostles. But the devil doesn't know that in his foolishness and pride. And he thinks he has defeated them. But he has defeated And Christ speaks of the defeat before it happens. It will be several days before Judas finally gets his money. And before he finally hands over Christ. But our Lord is warning them. Walk as children of the light. Walk whilst you have the light. And the darkness, the darkness not overtake you, overtake you not. And he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. That's the trouble today. People walk in darkness. We don't know anymore what Jesus Christ taught. We don't know anymore what the saints have prophesied. We don't know anymore what has happened in the history of our Holy Church. We don't know anymore our simple catechism. We don't know anymore the gospel. We don't know anymore all the things we used to know. And we claim that we still do. But we don't know. And the Lord says, who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. So many souls today, Catholic souls, so many souls today, standing for the truth, they don't know where they're going. They don't know what to do. And Lord Jesus Christ says, walk in the light. Where do you go on Holy Thursday night? You can go to a safe place, or you can go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is a very unsafe place. It would normally be a safe place, but unfortunately Jesus Christ is going there. And when he went there on only Thursday night, because he was there, it was an unsafe place. And therefore, he went to that garden of Gethsemane. And what did the apostles do? They went with him. They went with him. Though it was an unsafe place. And what are we to do? Walking outside of the gates of the city. You know, it seems as though in our present crisis of the church, you're walking outside the gates of the city. You're not approved by the Pope. You're not approved by the church. You don't have the backing of the whole church and all those various organizations within the church. Why are you walking outside the city? The city is about to be besieged. It is a time of grave danger. Don't walk outside the city. Not at a time like this. Don't go into the, into the night where a mob and soldiers with swords and clubs can come and get you. But that's where Jesus Christ went. That's where he went. Had he stayed in the upper room, he could not have been captured by the mob. But he went. Very much like Garcia Moreno knew on the morning that he died that he would die. He knew he'd be killed. And they said, do you want extra guards? He says, no. I don't want extra guards. I walk each morning from my house over to the cathedral and I say my prayers. So I do today. And then I walk back to the office to run the government. So I do today. I never walk with guards. I don't walk with guards today. But you're in danger. This is what I do. And he went. And he said his prayers. And he went out. 
he was killed with a machete. Only he had a guard. And what did he say? I die, but God does not die. And he became the glory of Ecuador and the only glorious president of the last 200 years because he died for the blood of Christ. He saw it after the cross. And we are now in a time in which we need to have the heart of Garcia Moreno. And we have the heart of Heraclius when he was young. <coughs> we have the heart of the saints. What do you do when you're defeated in battle? What do you do when your army has been routed? What do you do when the enemy is overtaken? What do you do when all the communists and masons and Jews have surrounded you? Go to war. That's what you do. We do not retreat. We do not defend the positions that we have held. We don't try to save our churches, our buildings. We don't try to save, make sure that we don't lose the rectory, make sure we don't lose the school, make sure that we don't lose the buildings. And remember what St. Athanasius said, let them have the buildings. We have the faith. That's what we must have. Our ancestors had mass without buildings when they had the mass in the catacombs. Our ancestors had the faith even without the mass when they were locked up in prison, <coughs> when they had to travel great journeys, and when they were, they were captured by the enemies of God and locked in the gulags and the prisons. But they carried the treasure of faith. And they were not trying to defend lambs. They were not trying to defend lambs that had been conquered. They were out to attack. And that's what Heraclius realized. And God has inspired Heraclius. Don't defend Jerusalem. Don't defend the land against the attack of the enemy. Attack. I am not a commander that is interested in holding things. I am a commander that is interested in conquering things. And that's the spirit that we have to have in this great battle. And what are we to do? One of our challenges is we want to give ourselves to God after we've failed in the world. We want to give ourselves to God after we've taken care of ourselves. You know, Father, I, I want to help the church, but first I've got to get out of debt. First I've got to take care of my basic responsibilities. First I've got to take care of myself. First I've got to do this. First I've got to do that. And after all that's done, when I get a little extra, I'm going to help you out. God isn't interested in being the extra. He's not interested in that. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters. One of the reasons why we have fresh flowers on the altar. What do you do with a flower? You take it in its pride. When it's a very young and beautiful plant, it still has a long life to live. It has a long life ahead of it. In the life of flowers, their life is not as long as ours. So when you, when you cut a flower in its prime, you've cut half its life or three quarters of its life away. But you cut that flower and you bring it to the altar. You bring it to the object of love. And you say, I've taken this flower in its prime. I've taken this flower in its strength. I've taken this flower in its glory. And I give it to the object of my love. Why let the flower keep living? What will happen? It withers, it wilts, it rots, it dies, and it smells. Who needs that kind of flower? And therefore, we cut the flower in its prime. And so many people, once they've lost their jobs, once they've lost their health, once they've lost everything else, that's when it's time to turn to God. Because we're in a terrible fix. <laughs> and so they turn to God. And then he gives them back their health. And he gives them back their strength. And as soon as their health and strength come back, so soon do they turn away from God and go back to the world. Until they get sick again. And then they go back to God. <laughs> and then he gives them back their strength. And he gives them back their health. And as soon as it comes back, they go back to the, they go back to the world. God wants soldiers. He wants soldiers in his army. He wants soldiers that give their youth to him. 
He wants soldiers that give their life to him. He wants soldiers that give their whole strength to him. Who are ready to be cut off in their pride. Who are ready to give up the world in their pride. Who are ready to give up all the things that this world has to offer. Which isn't much by the way. In order to go to God. How many young men God wants to be priests. How many young ladies he wants to give themselves to a life in the convent. To a religious life. Well, they have to wait until the marriage falls apart. They have to wait until they get dumped. They have to wait until they lose their jobs. They have to wait until they're in difficult circumstances. And then they come to God. But we need souls that are ready to give themselves to God. In the battle, this is the time to raise an army. Now is the time to raise an army. Heraclius had a large army. And he was defeated. And the enemy was stronger than he ever was before. And then when he was completely defeated, God said, Now is the time to raise an army. Now go out and get those soldiers that have fled the battlefield. Now go out and get those guys that don't know how to swing a sword. Now go out and raise an army. Because these men that go to fight, they're ready to fight. And then give them something to fight for. Don't fight to defend. Something that's going to rot anyway. Don't fight to defend something you're going to lose anyway when you die, but fight for glory. Fight for something of value. Fight for the cross. Fight to conquer the infidel lands. Fight to defeat the enemy. Don't fight to defend yourself against ISIS. Don't fight to preserve what's left of our pathetic Protestant culture in America. Don't fight to maintain what was left of our little freedoms. The freedom to smoke cigarettes in a bar. <laughs> I don't want the right to smoke cigarettes in a bar, man. I hate having to go outside and smoke. Because it really stinks getting drunk inside, going outside and smoking. I'm going to get drunk and smoke at the same time. <laughs> I want my rights. <laughs> and that's what we're fighting for. Don't fight for the right to drink and smoke at the same time. Don't fight for the right to keep and bear arms. Don't fight for the right to stop abortions. Fight to conquer the enemies of God. Fight to spread the kingdom of Christ. Fight to convert the whole world for Christ. Fight to transform our entire lives and everything into the servants of our Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. That's what we do. When we look back in history, that's what David did when he fought alone against Goliath. That's what the three young men did when they stood alone against the emperor, the greatest the world has ever known. So says sacred scripture. What does scripture know? And these three boys stood up against him. And they won. And they won. And all Lord Jesus Christ said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. Moses saying, you want to crucify me, go ahead. And when you crucify me, I will destroy you. When you crucify me, I will conquer hell. When you crucify me, I will drive out the devil. And then what do they say? You're a strange king. You're a strange God. Who is this son of man? We studied our catechism. We know what the prophets say. Ezekiel says you're going to reign forever. Isaiah says you're going to reign forever. And the Son of Man is going to be crucified? The Son of Man is going to die on a cross? What kind of Son of Man is this? You're a strange Son of Man. You say you're the Son of Man. But we know the Son of Man reigns forever. You say you will conquer by dying. A strange Son of Man. Yet a little while the light is among you. That's the response. A little while the light is among you. Read Jeremiah. What does he say? Read Isaiah and other places. What does he say? They say that I shall be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And right here is one of my 12 apostles who's right now making a deal with you. For what? 30 pieces of silver. Don't you know the prophecy? You're supposed to know the prophecy. I told you the prophecy in advance. Why are you, Caiaphas, going to give this traitor 30 pieces of silver this very day? 
When you know the prophecy, but you have blinded yourself to it. And when you decide to scourge me and crown me with thorns, do you not know what Isaiah said? That the Son of Man shall be beaten from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Not, not a bone of him shall you break. You will not break one of my bones, not a single one. And so it was said in prophecy. And all the other prophecies, I have told you I will reign forever. And it will be on the throne. Only you think it is going to be from one of your pathetic thrones. I don't reign from your throne. I am God. I reign from my throne. And the throne that I have chosen to reign from is the wood of the cross. And I really am lazy. Because remember, our child is a, our king is a child. Remember it said the child shall lead them. We don't like constructing tanks. We just want to drive them and shoot the guns. We don't like building rifles. We just want to shoot them. We don't want to be in the ammunition delivery. We don't want to be the guy delivering the ammunition. We want to be the guy shooting the gun. Who wants to be in the supply train? And Jesus Christ is a child. So he let the devil provide the supplies. He let the devil bring the ammunition. He let the devil build the throne. And then the devil construct all the things necessary to rule a kingdom, and all they did was come. I don't like building thrones, even though I'm a carpenter. You build it. And so he built the cross. Satan built the cross, and Christ ruled from it. Satan brought the, the, the bullets of the nails, and then Christ used them to destroy him. Satan brought the weapon of the whip and the scourge, and Christ used it to destroy him. Just like David went into battle with five polished stones. And he killed Goliath with Goliath's own sword. This is the way of our warrior. We need to charge into battle with our hearts. Charge into battle with faith. Charge into the battle with the Spirit of God. When we are defeated, what do you do? Keep fighting. When your army is destroyed, what do you do? Build another one. When you don't have any hope, what do you do? Keep charging. And do not defend the pathetic things that you have kept. And this is a warning also in another part of the gospel. Where our Lord went to the man with one talent. Said, what did you do with your talent? I buried it. I protected it. I defended it. I put a security system around it. I went out and moved to the country. I defended it. I was safe. I was proper. I was sanitary. I made sure that my talent was not lost. Because I saw the economic conditions in the world, and there was an economic collapse, and I didn't want to lose that talent. So I buried it. And let me go and dig it up. Here it is. Unprofitable servant. Depart from me, accursed. Why didn't you give it to the usurers? Why didn't you increase and multiply? I didn't give you a talent to bury it. It is not our duty to survive the chastisement. Brother Tim used to mention before one of the arguments against survival of the fittest. Supposing you're a really smart plankton in the ocean. You went to plankton school. You learned how to escape whales. How do you survive? Just hope a whale doesn't come your way. Because if he does, I don't care how many plankton moves you move in your plankton karate school, it ain't going to work. You're going to become dinner for a whale. God determines for the path of the whale. And if you're in it, you're dead. So many have tried to escape death and have found it. And our Lord Jesus Christ said, Seek to preserve your life and you shall lose it. Therefore, don't be stupid. Don't try to preserve your life. But rather, fight to spread the kingdom of Christ. You're going to build your little big conclave out in the middle of nowhere. You're going to protect yourself. And then the Jews are going to drop a test bomb in the middle of nowhere to see if it works. <laughs> and it's going to land right on top of your house. <laughs> and so remember, saving ourselves is a waste of time. Let us cut the flower of our lives. Take our treasures. Take our strengths. Take whatever God has given us. And give it back to him. We need young men and young ladies to give their lives to God now. Not after the economic collapse. Walk while you have the light. When that time came, 
that the rains came. They all prayed. They all begged forgiveness. And they all wanted inside the ark. Not one of them was allowed in. Now is the time. And when our Lord Jesus Christ said, Now the judgment has come, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. So likewise, the judgment has already come on the 20th and 21st century. The judgment has already come. Just like Samson was defeated. But he didn't know it. Because he didn't feel any pain when he got a haircut. And he rose up to go to battle. But he was already defeated. And the Philistines easily overcame him. But he did not know that he didn't have his strength. He didn't know that he wouldn't win this time. He didn't know he couldn't break the bonds. Because he didn't feel any different. And so be with us. That's why Lord Jesus Christ said, When the Son of Man comes, they will be given in marriage. They will be doing business. It's going to be just another ordinary day. It is on ordinary days that we must give ourselves to God. It is on ordinary days that we must repent of our sins. It is on ordinary days that we must make a change of our life. Because if you wait until you're sick, or you wait until the world's sick, you wait too long. And as St. Alphonsus says, the confession of a sick man is sick. So it applies to the individual. In other words, you confess because you're sick and not because you're sorry, and therefore you're not forgiven. The same is true of the world. There will be many souls that will confess and have great prayer when the chastisement hits, and God will not hear the vast majority of those prayers. Because now is the time to pray. Now is the time to turn to God. Because the judgment is now. The visible battle is coming soon. So then God bless you all from the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.